But I, I would still give that book to young people. Um, there are some books from my childhood that haven't aged gracefully, um, that, you know, turn out to be wildly racist in retrospect or something, that I wouldn't give to a very young reader without, you know, an t- opportunity to make it a conversation. But that's not one of them. It's really a lovely book. It's just a sad book. It's a book that'll make you cry and cry and cry. But I've written a couple of those myself, so. Well, it's uh, something I go back and forth on, uh, and I haven't I haven't made my peace with it either way. Uh, is some of these great authors that I looked up to. Um, Brawl Dahl is one of the examples I usually use because he's one of my absolute favorites. Uh, and I love The Witches. It is my favorite middle grade book, and it is undeniably sexist. Uh, as yeah. I go back and I read it as an adult, you can't miss it. It's right there. And as I think about all the time, as I must have read that book uh, 20, 25 times uh, growing up, because just every summer I'd pick it put it back in rotation at least once because it was the only middle grade book I knew of that was really scary. There were other middle grade books my mom would let me read. Like, you know, there was Benicula and I love Benicula, but Benicula (laughs) is not scary. The witches is scary. Mm -hmm. Um, And, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's undeniably sexist. I think, well, one is that maybe some responsible for some issues with women I had early on (laughs) and two, uh, at least partly, uh, probably also growing up in the eighties didn't, didn't help. Uh, And then two, but, can I pass that on to my son? How much weight should we give that? Because if you take the sexism out and it's real hard to separate in the story about killer women attacking a, a small boy. Um, but if you take that sexism out, is that still a brilliant work that should be revered that we should learn from? Um, and how do you handle that? Is it just having a conversation with a young reader that, Hey, this is in here. Let's talk about it enough. Or should we say, Nope, let's start. We'll start with new books because I worry that as authors, just by definition, progress is going to move beyond us, I hope. Uh, And so at one point, there will be things in our books that are not as progressive uh, as wherever we hopefully end up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, hopefully the entire 20th century will age badly. Right. I mean, hopefully they're going to move beyond some of the stuff that's like deeply programmed into us. Um, And I don't know. I don't know how to deal with, um, I mean, there are some books that are given to really young readers with no context that I think probably shouldn't be. Like I read Little House on the Prairie maybe 50 times when I was little, because I'm from there. I'm from Nebraska, South Dakota. Um, You know, I went out personally to see the farmstead where Pa planted the cottonwood trees. I mean, this was a holy pilgrimage for me. (laughs) <laughs> but I probably wouldn't give those books. I didn't give those books to my girls when they were the same age that I was when I when I loved them. I might give them to them now. They're 11 and 14 now. So they're a little bit almost too big to read them. Um, but if they read them now, I, you know, read them alongside like the Birch Bark House. And let's talk about, you know, let's talk about American Westward Expansion and who was there before the actual Westward Expansion started. And there's a lot to unpack in those books that's just, it's buried so deep that I think it just gets right in at little readers. I don't know. Um, On the other hand, authors are human, right? And none of us are perfect. And, you know, none of our books are going to be perfect. And I think extending a certain amount of forgiveness to each other is probably important. Um... I don't know that everybody is obligated to forgive everything and especially with authors who, you know, don't aren't self-reflective and don't ask for forgiveness. Um, but you know, I've written some, I've written, I was just talking the other day in Plain Kate, my very first novel, there's a character uh, who's albino and a witch. And I wouldn't do that again. I didn't realize I was writing out of Russian fairy tales in which that is a real trope. Um, You know, I'd read this 500 page book of Russian fairy tales and I just put it back on the page. I didn't realize that um, that's still a stereotype that still hurts people with albinism. I mean, there are parts of the world where that will still get you killed. uh, Because you might be a witch because because you you were born albino. Mm -hmm. You know, so I wouldn't do it again. Um, But I think it's still a good book. And, you know, I hope 
that, you know, if there's an albino reader, maybe this is not the book for them. Maybe this is something they don't need to forgive. Um, but I hope that some of my other readers will extend some forgiveness to me. I, I did write an albino character into the Scorpion Rules just for the chance to do it better. And he is, you know, just kind of a rock star with cool prosthetic eyes and a uh, er, Lithuanian accent that's sort of adorable. He's the engineer who blows things up of the group. So, so is that your uh, writerly penance? My little writerly, <laughs> my little writerly chance to do it better. To write a really awesome character with albinism is, instead of actually the um, the witch character is awesome too, but still, I wouldn't do it again. I don't know. Makes sense. I try to keep a nice, healthy dose of forgiveness, especially for authors of the past. Because one, I want that applied to me, just absolutely. <laughs> um, but two, it's it's also I, you know, I, I I think we're both old enough now to remember a time when the internet wasn't a thing. Uh, when I want to shock uh, young people at, at school visits or when I meet them, I tell them I when I grew up there was no internet. They're like, oh my god, oh. Were, were there dinosaurs? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and it's hard to remember a time when everybody didn't have uh, such widely available access to information, uh, mm -hmm. which is just crucial to trying to go back and understanding that younger mindset. Um, like, for example, when I'm uh, another uh, favorite author of mine is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And mm -hmm. I like to joke that because I'm a flying saucer enthusiast, mm -hmm. um, that should that ever be proven to absolutely have been a hoax, completely made up, I don't think that's likely. But if it were to be so, I would want people to look at me the same way and separate that out a little bit the way I look back at poor uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and his pictures of fairies. That mm -hmm. like, dude. 10 seconds on Google, we can prove that that's not a thing. But there was no Google. <laughs> he just had the, the photograph, and all the photographs he'd ever look at were not that great. And you could see a, a, a brilliant mind kind of going down that rabbit hole, and uh, mm -hmm. I think that's forgivable. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. I, I think, you know, times change and cultures change, but we do stay human. Uh, so I think we can connect to um, these people who, you know, have written something that just today it just wouldn't fly. Like if you wrote that today, you would just be, I'm not thinking of Doyle specifically because I actually, I'm a huge Sherlock Holmes fan. Um, but there's plenty of stuff uh, from the 19th century where if it was written today, it would just have to be written by a clueless human being. Um, but it wasn't. You know, it was written by, you know, someone with, deep compassion and caring and talent and insight into their society. And I don't know, I don't think we have to throw all those things out necessarily. You know, I think maybe just some awareness of how things change and how our culture informs what we do is probably a smart thing to have. It's tricky. It's tricky though. I and mean, you know, I, I talk as a white woman, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really not generically the person who's affected by this I'm you know I'm it's easy for me to forgive because in most cases I'm not the one that's getting hurt so you know brown people may well have different perspectives and I think probably you know it's worth listening to those before you listen to me but since I'm here there you go that's mine no, I'm a heterosexual white male that grew up in a small Indiana town of mostly heterosexual <laughs> white people, or at least uh, uh, officially heterosexual. That's <laughs> how I should <laughs> phrase that. Um, and uh, then I, uh, I fell in love with uh, with an African American woman in college, and, and we married, and uh, we have a beautiful child together. Uh, and it was um, uh, just it wasn't quite like taking the red pill in the matrix. Um, mm -hmm. But it was unbelievably eye opening looking at all these things I'd never had to look at in a particular way before. Mm -hmm. And it, it almost, it, it, I, I uh, would joke that it was like discovering that you've been living in a conspiracy theory, but the mm -hmm. conspiracy is so unbelievably obvious that that's why it was impossible to see because it's just so in your face, the, the institutional mm -hmm. racism that, that, that surrounds us and creates, uh, makes all things possible. Oh, I got yeah. me thinking like, oh, maybe my all white Indiana town didn't happen by accident. Oh, that changes things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, racism is a thing. I think it's easy for white people to miss racism because it's a structure that we're standing on top of, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to see the ground. So. 
Well, that's another one of those things that I think is um, is a very uh, human thing. I remember when Katrina happened. Um, mm-hmm. I was uh, with my father in law, and we were watching. Uh, well, he was he was my girlfriend's dad at the time. He's my father in law now. Uh, we were watching the the victims and uh, from the Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, uh, and then we saw some people commenting on it, and you know they were white. Uh, wealthier people, and they said, well, if I were in that situation, we'd have just piled the family into our SUV, and we got four-wheel drive, we'd have just driven right out of there. Uh, Just a complete lack of empathy and understanding. Mm -hmm. Uh, Which is why sometimes when I get all fired up about uh, billionaires, uh, and and, and it's it's a passion of mine, is how much I hate billionaires, because I I don't think they're admirable people, and I think if there's one thing that I can impart to people, it's stop thinking billionaires are good. They think they're good. They're delusional. You can't listen to them. (laughs) <laughs> objectively they're not um but then i think about how i don't spend uh, my moments i don't give every penny i have uh to charity uh mm-hmm. and i have some some pennies i could be given um and i try and judge i don't know what i'm trying to get at other than i just try and cut humans some slack just because it's difficult to be a human and you don't know what you don't know yeah yeah i think that's probably that's a good takeaway that's a really good takeaaway so. Well, that got extra philosophical, extra it early. Did. I had <laughs> really, really early. We're talking about the, uh, um, you know, racial biases of the canon. Let's talk about something different. <laughs> Meaning of life. <laughs> That's the next that, hour. Rob. There's no <laughs> way for us to fix that in the next hour. The canon has racial biases. Stipulated. Okay. <laughs> 